is a courtroom. In your town, USA. This is the jury. Twelve men and women, citizens of the community, performing a basic civic duty. A doctor, housewife, mother, a worker, sales girl, farmer, employer. Please rise. Hear ye, hear ye. This court, in and for the people of this county and this state, is now in session. Be seated. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, a most serious offense has been committed against the people of this state. We shall present to you the nature of this offense and through the evidence determine the purpose of this offense and the identity of the responsible offenders. There are two factors common to almost every crime. The criminal puts his own desires above the good of society, even to the point of violence to achieve his selfish ends. And the criminal will attempt to conceal his identity, hoping to escape punishment for his crime. In this case, however, violence has been done to the public welfare. The casualties are truth and fact, and the victims are we, the people. I wish to place in evidence Exhibit A, a bill submitted to become the law in this state. This law would affect every one of us. It carries the title of right to work. Sounds good, doesn't it? But can you judge a book or a law by its cover? No. There was a time when we took anybody's word for what was in a cover or a label. For instance, in the good old days... wonderful properties of this Remedios Your Cure snake oil. Makes a man feel like a boy and a boy feel like a man. Guaranteed to give the ladies the perpetual bloom of youth. Yes, sir, ladies and gentlemen, this is the original, the one and only, the absolutely guaranteed Sure Cure snake oil. Compounded of scatterfran herbs and containing concentrated fortisat, ladies and gentlemen, and to protect the public from such phony labels and false promises, we adopted pure food and drug laws. The Supreme Court of Idaho recognized this principle by refusing to permit this deceptive right to work title on a measure for the voters. And remember, you only suffered from phony snake oil if you bought it. But with phony deals such as these, if your state legislators are fooled by it, you will have to take it whether you like it or not. Now, how does this mislabeled masquerade affect us, we the people? Well, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the states of our nation. These workers take home more in their paychecks, more with which to buy the products of America's expanding production. More foodstuffs, clothing, homes and home furnishings, appliances, farm equipment, automobiles, all of the things which go to make up our American standard of living. Yes, the states which lead in total annual income for the average wage earner are the states which have shunned or rejected right to work laws. In sharp contrast, the official statistics also prove that those states which have adopted so-called right to work laws are far behind in terms of the hard facts of working conditions, benefits, and take home pay with a lower annual income for the average wage earner and therefore lower purchasing power and a lower standard of living. We have only briefly summarized the economic, the dollars and cents reasons why right to work laws hurt the public, we the people. Now let us hear from witnesses most qualified to tell us why this law is an offense on ethical and moral grounds. First, from the Catholic faith, Father William J. Kelly. I hold that history testifies that the union shop in America has been a stabilizing influence in industrial relations. The right to work bills don't guarantee the individual any right at all. They provide him 
with an opportunity to work alone and to work at less than union wages. I hold that such legislation makes a mockery of the constitutional right to organize for the common good and welfare. All good men and women, Protestants, Jews and Catholics, should seek by every just means to get right to work laws repealed and should oppose them whenever they are proposed. Next, we hear from another authority on moral and ethical justice, Rabbi Israel Goldstein. I condemn the so-called right to work laws because I know that the term right to work in these statutes is a fraud and a misnomer concealing their true purpose. The sole effect of these right to work laws is to outlaw the arrangements freely and democratically arrived at between employers and trade unions which represent the majority of the workers. Unions are required by law to represent all the workers in a bargaining unit, not only those who are members of the union. But only the members of the union, through their dues and activities, are carrying the cost and the burden of supporting the union. What about the remaining workers? They are receiving the benefits of unionism without contributing to the support of the unions. In the vernacular, they are free riders. Under such circumstances, it is obviously not morally right or justifiable from any other point of view that workers should not join the union and should go along as free riders. It is therefore eminently fair that while the workers are represented by the union and receive their benefits from the union, they should not be given a statutory right to pretend that the union doesn't exist. After all, as Americans, we must all recognize that one of the foundations of democracy is majority rule. Our next witness in behalf of moral and ethical standards versus right to work laws, Reverend Lilburn Mosley. The words right to work is a phrase that says what it does not mean. Every American who believes in the Constitution of the United States believes that a man has a right to work, that is to support his family regardless of race or religion or nationality. But these laws never mean this. They mean primarily that a man has the right to benefit from better wages, better hours, and better working conditions without working to sustain those conditions or without supporting the organization through which they were made possible. But more and worse than this, these right to work laws actually encourage a man to underbid the American standard of living, to set labor against labor, to weaken labor's bargaining power. The real purpose is not the right to work, but the power to destroy organized labor by law. To refuse to pay dues and claim the right of union benefits not only threatens the union itself, but what is far worse, threatens the very standard of American life, which has been brought about primarily by organization. Wise management knows that you cannot build a great America on deceived, disorganized, and exploited workers. We have presented the facts and the figures, the economic reasons, and three highly qualified witnesses to testify on the moral and ethical reasons for opposing and condemning right-to-work laws. I would now like to call the next witness. Mr. Roberts, please. Mr. Mark Roberts. Raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Be seated. 
Mr. Roberts, would you please tell the court in your own words why you were in favor of right-to-work laws and why you were against joining a union at your place of employment? Well, when I was first hired, I didn't see any reason why I should join the union. I figured if I could get a job on my own, I didn't need any union. A couple of the fellows who worked on my shift introduced themselves and started to tell me about their union. They tried to tell me about the benefits of union membership, but I wouldn't listen. I told them I didn't want any union telling me what to do. <laughs> I guess I was another one of those guys who think if you read it in a newspaper, that makes it true. So I thought right-to-work laws were a great idea, and I told them so. Well, sometime later, I found my classification and pay rate had been lowered. When I tried to tell the foreman that I had been unfairly downgraded, he wouldn't listen to my side of the story. He didn't listen to me any better than I had been willing to listen to Joe Crowley and Art Shields about the union. That started me thinking. I finally decided maybe I'd been as wrong as the foreman. I wanted to hear all the facts, the union side of the story. So I asked Joe Crowley and Art Shields. I learned that Joe was the shop steward for the union. And I learned a lot more during that lunch, too. I learned that the wage scale, working hours and conditions, lunch and rest periods, vacations and vacation pay, sick and accident benefits, the pension plan, all of it just didn't happen. They weren't handed to anyone on a silver platter. It all took work, hard work and organization and collective bargaining. Yeah, good old horse trading the American way between the union and the company. And I found out this hadn't put the company out of business either. Production, earnings and profits were at top levels. And even if I contributed my fair share of support to the union, to my co-workers, I still was way ahead. All their hard work, the sweat, the sacrifices were done. Yes, sir. I was listening, and I was learning. Joe took my problem up with the union shop grievance committee, and then he got an appointment with the plant supervisor. With the help of Joe and the grievance committee, my problem was handled fairly. I got back my grade without loss of any seniority, and in fact, I won a higher rate of pay. Well, I guess I found out that teamwork pays off on the job, too. And the only right I found in the right to work laws was the right to work for less or not work at all. But with the teamwork of my shop steward, the grievance committee and the union, I had the right to be represented and to negotiate my grievances. That's part of why I changed my mind about the right to work law and why I joined the union. Thank you, that's all for now. Some idea of how many Americans agree with the previous witness may be gotten from the fact that for over four years, the Taft-Hartley law included a provision that before any union shop could be negotiated, all the workers had to vote to authorize this arrangement by secret ballot. During this period, over 46,000 elections were held, with more than five and a half millions of workers voting. Over 91% favored the union shop, and negotiation of the union shop was authorized in over 97% of these cases. Congress finally saw the absurdity of spending millions of the taxpayers' dollars for these elections required by Taft-Hartley, in which the results were so overwhelmingly one-sided. And Congress repealed this provision of the law. Majority rule makes a democracy function with due regard for the right of the minority. But what minority has the right to exceed proper speed limits because they wish to? What minority has the right to run through traffic stop signs because they are in haste? What minority has the right not to recognize the President of the United States because they did not vote for him? And what right does any minority have not to pay their income taxes because they do not believe in them? What minority has the right to be free riders at the cost of their fellow citizens? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have shown the camouflage and subterfuge used to conceal the true purpose of these so-called right-to-work laws. 
But who are their sponsors? An expert on labor legislation has testified. The powerful interests supporting this mislabeled legislation prefer to work anonymously. Because if they came out in the open, they would be revealed as the same groups that have fought every move for social and economic progress in America for the past 50 years. A well-known journalist has gone on record. Let's face it, the real purpose of right to work laws is to wreck unions. These laws are another disguised weapon in the hands of those determined groups who would smash the free democratic trade unions and associations of working men and women in our nation. If they could, they would turn the clock of progress back to the end of the last century and before. An expert economist on right to work sponsors. To these powerful interests, 12 and 16 hour workdays, no vacations with or without pay, large numbers of unemployed, desperate for work at any wage, and each worker stripped of the protection of his or her union. This is their goal. If permitted, they will tear down the years of labor management achievements with their so-called right to work laws, achievements which have meant the production records, the American standard of living which we all enjoy, achievements at which the rest of the world marvels. The facts of life prove beyond dispute that unions have helped to build up the economy of our country by lifting the standards of living and working conditions, by raising purchasing power so that industry can profitably sell its expanded production. Any legislation aimed at weakening or destroying labor unions is therefore a backward step, and one which is dangerous and detrimental to the continued prosperity and economic health of our nation. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the case for the people rests. Yes, this is the court of public opinion. We have heard the evidence, for we are the jury. And the judge, you be the judge.